Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. On today's show, we pick up part two of our interview with Aaron Smith-Levin. As we ended part one, Aaron was describing the first crack in the dam of his Scientology experience occurred when actor Jason Begay spoke out on YouTube in June of 2008 about the reasons why he, Jason Begay, was leaving the Church of Scientology. These videos were made by videographer and our good friend Mark Bonker. For new Scientology watchers, I highly recommend you watch the original YouTube videos to hear Jason speak very powerfully and forcefully about why he left the church. These videos were so extraordinary that Alex Gibney used the videos along with current interviews of Jason McGee in, in the documentary Going Clear. This HBO documentary has become a phenomenon. It's interesting to see the church's inability to address a documentary that simply features former members talking about their experience. Going back earlier to 2008, Jason speaking out had a deep and profound effect, not only on Aaron Smith-Levin, but on a lot of Scientologists. These YouTube videos got noticed, particularly coming as they did months after the January 24, 2008 release of Anonymous's powerful video that shook the Church of Scientology. Jason's videos following as they did presented the church with a profound challenge from social media that it has never been able to address, simply because it will not tell the truth about anything. Aaron begins part two by describing the second crack in the dam of the, his Scientology experience. And this has to do with the int base or what we call the complex here in Los Angeles. And then the second crack was the St. Pete Times um, in their Truth Rundown series. Because of course I knew and worshiped Marty Rathman and Mike Rinder and Tom DeVox and Don Jason. These were my, these were my idols growing up. <laughs> these were my role models. Aaron, you make you make an interesting point. I want to explore it because you know Marty was the number two guy. Mm -hmm. Mike is the number three, mm -hmm. and these are authority figures, you know, of good character and reputation in the church. And then suddenly they're speaking out against David Miscavige. Now you you said that when you left in 2006, you were not disaffected at all, and you thought if things were around the way David Miscavige wanted them run, LA would be better. It'd be like flat. Right. You know, what's going on in your mind where you have one image of David Miscavige in the church and then you have top executives yeah. sp speaking out. What does that do to you? You know, it wasn't as – it didn't screw with my mind as much as you would think. It was much more like, oh, I get it. It, it just flipped mm. the way I was thinking about it in reverse, and here's what I mean. I always had the idea that int management was like a utopia, that the int base, the gold base, it was just a utopia where people didn't have to run around worrying about getting their stats up by Thursday at 2 – um, where everybody was a trained auditor, where everybody was clear or OT, and everyone just got along great. Because what the hell are you going to fight about? You're, in the, you're on a base in the middle of the desert where you, you don't even have to deliver to public. W what could there possibly be to fight about? That's how I envisioned int management. And I always wanted to go to int management. I always wanted to be promoted. So, uh, so when things were really crappy at the lower level orgs, I was always like, well, it's crappy here, but that's only because it's not int. Int is better. But when I found out, uh, you know, through all these people's stories, that it was actually worse edit management, the way it flipped my thinking is, oh, the shittiness that one could observe and experience at the LA orgs, that was the trickle-down effect. It wasn't because we were too far from it management that we weren't better. That's why it wasn't worse. <laughs> it, was, it was the trickle-down effect from how bad it was at it management. And one thing about the orgs in the Los Angeles area is um, – Int management would use it as a dumping ground to send staff that they didn't want. But, really? but these staff, they were never you know, properly, let's just say, they were never properly dismissed. They were never dismissed from int management through the proper procedures. They were pretty much just kicked out the door you know, uh, and you know, labeled a bad person and sent down to PAC. So PAC was like a dumping ground for Sea Org members who were kicked out of the int base. And these people were crusty, disaffected people who just had nowhere else to go. And I, re I started to realize that that's what contributed to the, the, the LA area orgs being so hard to live in and work in is because all, all these people that were there, they already knew that int management was a crappy place to be. They already knew David Miscavige was a tyrant. They already knew there was no actual justice in Scientology. It was just David Miscavige's whim. They just had nowhere else to go. So they sat there. They didn't act like Sea Org members. They didn't act like they were trying to get the show on the road or trying to, you know, they weren't enthusiastic about what they did. They just wanted to be left alone. 
well, you can't just be left alone in the sewer. You have to go with the ship or get the hell off. Um, so it's part of what made it uh, hard to work in those orgs. So they were full of disillusioned people. Uh, Aaron, it's interesting that Aaron Hubbard called Earth a, a prison planet that had been a dumping ground. Right. And no, and, and so you see that uh, Int Base in Hemet, California uses Pack Base in Los Angeles as a dumping ground. Yep. Let me ask you a question. I just as a you know longtime Scientology watcher. Is it true that the flag rejects are sent to the Tampa org? Oh, totally true. So if you don't cut it at flag, they dump you on Tampa. Well, let's define um, not being able to cut it. Uh, it's usually pu sure, public. Please. It's not staff members who can't cut it. So okay. if you're in the Sea Org at flag and you can't cut it, you might be sent to another Sea Org org, but most likely you're just going to leave the Sea Org. Um, it's public who are not qualified for services at flag. So an example would be if anybody has ever had a heart condition uh, they're not allowed to do services at Flag because Flag, at Lisa McPherson taught Flag some lessons, which is we don't want anything to do with medical problems of practitioners anymore because it's too expensive to deal with the fallout. Um, in fact, I have a horrible story to tell you. Um, just remind me before we get off, Sandy Lattimore, I'm going to tell you a story. Well, no, let, let, let's let's go into Sandy right now. Okay. When on the topic because Flag doesn't want anyone dying on the base. Right. And I know, I know plenty of people personally who, who were thrown off the base. Yeah, well, this guy was thrown off the base, but in a, in a, he was already unconscious when they threw him off the base. So well, what happened to so him? So Sandy Lattimore is a veteran um, staff member from the Philadelphia Org. In fact, he's the gentleman I was referencing that was actually supervised David Miscavige on his communications course when he was a child. So right. he, um, after all these years, he finally gets the flag to do, um, he's trying to get, he wants to do his OT levels. So he walks into the advanced org, which is this, called the Sand Castle. It's the one down on Osceola, the one on the water. And that's where the OT levels are, be, are delivered. He's routing into the org, which means he's, do, okay. he's doing the steps to, to be accepted. Well, he's, sure. he's standing there in reception. He has a stroke, goes unconscious, falls down, hits his head on the floor. Well, they are freaking out because they now have an unconscious body lying on their floor. And this guy hasn't even been accepted into the org yet, right? Oh, my God. That's uh, – what, what do they do? What happens? They pick him up. They carry him out to the sidewalk, public property, and put him on a damn bench and call an ambulance to come and pick him up. Nobody from the Sea Org meets the ambulance to explain to them what happened or who this gentleman is. Sandy spends somewhere between three to five days in the hospital as a John Doe. Now, he's not dead, so I'm, I'm still using the word John Doe as just an unidentified person. Uh, yeah, a, a transient. Okay. Uh, yeah. and like, So understand, he's been a Scientologist for 40 years. The guy's donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to the church. He came down to flag to do the OT levels. They leave him on the side of the street on a bench to be picked up as a transient by an ambulance, unidentified. They don't alert any family members or anything. Eventually, somebody contacts the Philadelphia org to tell them what happened to Sandy. Well, my mom at that time was already living here in Clearwater. So someone from the, but my mom wasn't even on staff. So the, the, the org contacts my mom to let her know what's happened. And she goes to the hospital and that's the first time anyone ever showed up to even say, I know who this man is and I'm vouch I'm here to help him. The church had just left him there. Aaron, that is depraved. Yeah. That's the correct word. And, it's depraved. And, and Jeff, just so you know what happened, he had, he had amnesia. He lost his memory. So he couldn't tell them who he was. That's the pro That's, that's the other thing that happened here. But of course, no one knew that until my mom showed up. Well, not so you have a, a, a 40 year long term Scientologist. They throw him out on the street like a piece of garbage and they let the taxpayer pay his medical bill. Yeah. And the guy's like 65 years old. He's not he's no he's he's, he's not a young guy. You know, now, Aaron, help me out here on the Scientology Money Project. I identify one point five billion dollars in church assets mm -hmm. on the 990 T's. Mm -hmm. The church has money. It's commonly thought that the IS has more than a billion dollars in cash. Mm -hmm. And yet they let a 40 year Scientologist stroke out on their facilities and they drag him outside. It's 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 truly disturbing. It is depraved. It is disgusting. Well, you could call it depraved indifference. Yeah. Rather than calling 9-11, they put him on a bench. So what 
did Sandy die? Did he get his memory back? What happened to him? Uh, through about a year of physical therapy, and I don't know what you call the therapy that they do with someone to try to jog their memory. He did regain most of his memory. Um, for about six months, he did not recognize even his closest friends. Um, and, uh, and he had a hard time speaking, and he had a hard time walking. And um, he's still in Scientology, Jeffrey. He's still in Scientology. He's recovered enough. He he's in Los Angeles. He's he's taking courses, and um, it's just it, it, I, I I don't even know if anyone ever actually explained to him what happened to him. I mean, I don't know, right? <laughs> you know. Well, and, and he may not remember because in, in that kind of uh, uh, the brain is damaged and it does affect memory. Yeah. And, and still in ways that they don't understand neurologically. Yeah. At Flag, they're so PR conscious. Everything's PR. I know someone who, uh, an OT8, who, he's, he's left the church a long time, but he originated seeing extraterrestrials mm -hmm. in session. Yeah. He was immediately escorted off flag land base and taken to the airport. Jeff, this is one of those things I've never been able to understand. It's part of the Scientology philosophy that there are aliens everywhere, that we are aliens, that... There is life everywhere. I mean, LRH has made it very clear that we're being monitored by aliens. We're in, being imprisoned by aliens. There's aliens on Mars, the moon, whatever. And yet, as a Scientologist, if you say you have ever seen an alien, God forbid you say you're abducted. I mean, that's just off the charts. If you say you have ever even seen an alien or a UFO, you are considered a security risk as being mentally unstable. How does that make any sense? Yeah, that, you know, this is an interesting question within the cosmology. Uh, because within the distinctive OT3 cosmology, incident two of OT3 is space lore Zeno, mm -hmm. body things. And this is commonly known. It's on the internet. Because of the even what Mr. Hubbard calls the space opera, mm -hmm. implanting stations on Mars, implanting stations on Venus, Markavs, heliotropes, yep. right? You have all these uh, 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 extraterrestrial races. And I think that was part of the appeal for maybe my generation. There was an interest in the 50s, 60s, 70s in UFOs, ETs. Yeah, I mean, even mine. To be honest. Oh yeah, going back to Roswell in 1947. So a lot of people were interested because Scientology was available uh, to discuss that and it had a reality on it, you would say. Right. And yet the church itself, if you talk about extraterrestrial contact, it is the kiss of death. It is. You'll not be permitted to do additional OT levels. They think there's something unstable about you. Um, I, I know many people, I know many public who in their folders have claimed to have some contact with some sort of alien beings and they are just, and, it, and here's what's funny. Sometimes the public don't even know that's why they're not being allowed onto services. Nobody actually sits down and says to them, listen, um, this is the problem. We, we don't like the fact that you're saying this and we're going to audit you until you retract it. No, no, no. It's just the technical personnel who are handling that person's folders and the people who are in charge of, of allowing people onto the OT levels. They just know this guy's not getting on. It's just one of these things. And it's never made any sense to me. I've never had a good explanation for why that happens. Well, now, would you get in trouble if you said you saw an angel or a demon? Is it the same thing? Oh, yeah. No, that, yeah, they'd think you were crazy. Yeah. So really, you can't have contact with any metaphysical entities. No, I mean, apparently it's okay to have telepathic communication with a body thing that's occupying your knee. But if you were to actually see, <laughs> if you were to actually see something that you thought was an alien being, that crosses a line. That's where we draw the line. <laughs> well, Aaron, Aaron, let's let's talk as business people. Yeah. Okay, now, because this is kind of, one reason I created my, my satire blog, OT is great, is because some stuff's so ridiculous, it's, it's satire. And then I have a serious blog money project, right? Yeah. And it's it, it's kind of trying to deal with the, the schizophrenic, I'm sort of mirroring the schizophrenic nature of Scientology. Mm -hmm. And as a business person, this is how I thought of it. Unless it's a Scientology brand spiritual entity, it's out of bounds. Right. A BT is addressable within auditing right. because we can make money off it. Mm -hmm. We're not going to make money off your damn alien, ET, angel, demon, familiar spirits. Yeah. And it's kind of a curious monetized uh, cosmology. Yeah. So unless you only see BTs, those will accept but this other class of entities. We won't. I know. You know, Jeffy, I'm just sitting here thinking about it and perhaps... Perhaps it comes down to the fact that if you're if if you don't have any personal if you don't believe that you're able to personally 
meet with and talk to aliens, then you're at the mercy of Scientology's description of how the aliens are manipulating planet Earth. But maybe what they're afraid of is that if you have a direct personal relationship to the aliens, that that maybe you're going to get some data that doesn't match up. <laughs> well, well, maybe. And, and because the, uh, their dire enemy, Scientology's dire enemy is psychiatry. Right. And they go back uh, billions of years on the whole track, the psychiatrists. Right. So they could be fundamentally be a psychiatrist. And it's hard to explain the intense subjectivity of Scientology to non-Scientologists. Mm-hmm. Because what you're doing in auditing is you're exploring intense subjective phenomena. Right. And you could have an item be a blue kangaroo on the moon. Right. And the auditor would go through, this is a... And, 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 and just to interject, Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung both said you could psychoanalyze subjective content or imaginary content and still produce a beneficial th- psychotherapeutic result. Okay. So I'm not questioning the content of anyone's subjectivity. That's just their subjectivity. And it's addressable in different ways spiritually. It, you could call it dreams. You could call it brain phenomena. Right. It, but I'm saying within Scientology, they keep it in a very narrow confines of session. Yeah. And within Hubbard's descriptors. Mm-hmm. That's why my argument's always been that Scientology is it whatever benefit you get from auditing that attention they free up is converted into an identity called must be a good Scientologist. Yeah. So that's why Scientology can never produce a spiritual master. Right. I mean, what to that point, what was the biggest spiritual experience or when you had in Scientology? I can tell you the biggest win I had. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it doesn't even sound uh, very profound. It's just that the effect that it had in my head was amazing. Um, first of all, I've never gone exterior. I've never had that phenomenon. If I did, honestly, if, if I had ever actually gone exterior through Scientology auditing, there's probably nothing you could have ever done to make me leave Scientology. I mean, it, honestly. like. <laughs> I, no, I understand. I understand. <laughs> so the biggest win for me was actually doing a course called Key to Life, which is a course that just has everything to do with the English language. Um, but in the but before you actually start studying the coursework on Key to Life, there's a section called Clay Table Processing. So it's Clay Table Auditing, and it's kind of like regular auditing, except the auditor gives you the command, and instead of answering verbally, you put your answer um, in clay. You, you you do a clay demonstration and clay representation of the answer to that question. So the subject of that auditing was about problems. Um, the Scientology has five definitions of a problem and it would say, you know, do a clay representation of this definition of a problem as, a, as, a, as, a, as a applied to you at an earlier point in your life. And I did this full time for five weeks. And when I say full time, I'm not talking 40 hours a week. <laughs> I'm talking 80 hours a week. Um, Understood. And it it sounds a little crazy and it sounds repetitive and it was, but the realizations um, that I had while doing this, uh, it made me feel like I actually grew up as a person, right? Um, Because I was looking at situations in my life. I remember I was 13 years old. You're not used to analyzing your life at 13 years old, okay? Hmm. So here I am, I'm spending five weeks analyzing situations in my life that were not optimum because I'm because everything I'm putting into clay is something that was a problem, right? Sure. And honestly, for me, and, and it's not like I'm saying everyone should go do this or this this show of Scientology is great, but this was just my biggest win in Scientology. So that, those five weeks um, changed me in a way that I feel, up until recently, I've always said that that clay table processing is what is the difference between who I was as a 12-year-old and who I am today. And that, that was true for me for a while, right? And, and yes. recently I was speaking with someone um, – I was actually chatting with Mike Rinder about this. And I said, you know, Mike, uh, Key to Life was a big deal for me. And, I, and I, I told him about it. And he said, well, look, that's great. He said, please don't sell yourself short. <laughs> he said, you were 13. People go through changes. You were just a child. Like he, he, he kind of said uh, – he wasn't trying to talk me out of the fact that anything I did on Key Life it, has helped me. But he said, don't – don't be don't get stuck with the idea that who you are today is because of one thing that you did when you were 13 years old everything could have turned out for you um, as well as it has or even better if you had gone a more traditional route outside of scientology he's like just don't don't have those blinders on that because that's what you did that's what did that to you and i said you know that's an interesting point that's an interesting point but that was my biggest win in scientology just um and well i, I don't know I, I haven't even said the win 
the win was just me having realizations about um, uh, about about certain people who had been causing bad conditions in my life. And that sounds very superficial and easy to say, but as a 13 year old um, walking through that process very slowly over five weeks, it, it was it, there was a profoundness to it that's hard to explain. No, I understand it fully. Uh, children can have very deep and profound experiences that define their, their future lives. Yeah. Two examples, uh, 13, 14 year old kids get on drugs, that changes the course of their life for the worse. Yeah. So you can have very defining, life-altering, dangerous experiences when you're young. Conversely, I'll, I'll share from my life. When I was 15 and a half years old, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. That had a gigantic impact on my life for the next uh, six years until I lost my faith. Right. But you no, know, uh, young teenagers are capable of very profound experiences. Yeah. Now, what I learned in being a Christian was how to study methodically because I was given what's called a, a Thompson uh, reference Bible, and it's extensively footnoted, mm. extensive. It's called a chain reference Bible, and I really learned how to think analytically by studying the Bible with the reference Bible. Mm. Because in your, your the Old Testament, it will give you references to the New Testament and vice versa. And studying the Bible taught me to think very analytically and to see relationships uh, in, in a body of knowledge. Yeah. And so it, it taught me to think systematically and it really helped me uh, in my business career and, and when I went to university. Hmm. So there's nothing wrong with saying that you you benefited through some procedure or technique. Where I where I differentiate, and I've done this with, with people who are devout Scientologists or even Christians, when you when you universalize your win to say this must apply widely to the entire universe and everybody, right. that's what I've object to. And I run Hubbard used a phrase that you can be stuck in a win. Mm -hmm. You can be stuck in a pleasure moment. And, and this happens in Christianity as well. I know I know people who got off heroin by accepting Jesus Christ. And so from there on, and, they're just that they're, that's the only way for them. You couldn't what, ever get them out of it, right? Well, yeah, and you you can't tell them that Jesus Christ is not real, that the Holy Spirit's not real, because they had this life changing experience for the better. They got off heroin, right. cold turkey. Right, right. I mean, they just kicked it. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that happen. It shows the power of the mind the power of experience right and so i would never negate anyone's win i think just as a civil libertarian i think people should have all the auditing they can afford right so no one at least in my circles opposes the the tech we're opposed to the human rights abuses totally i'm with you on that one and let me mention let me jump in to sort of reinforce something that you just said please that subjective reality that let's say you mentioned the guy who gets off heroin because he accepted jesus Good luck trying to convince that guy that Jesus isn't real, right? Exactly. When we mentioned earlier the, the Commodore's Messenger org, right? When you fill out the checklist or the little form for to see if you're qualified for the CMO, one of the things is, um, do you have an unshakable subjective certainty that auditing works, right? Hmm. If you don't, they don't want you in the CMO. They, <laughs> they only want kids who are, have, or who are already the equivalent of that heroin addict who got off drugs because he accepted Jesus. And you couldn't convince that guy otherwise, no matter what. Exactly. And that's, that's who they want at the top and they want him young. And that's why the CMO is composed of young people, right? Yes. And isn't it also true that they do a survey in the Sea Org about your feelings about having a strong central leader? If you might be referring to the leadership test. Yes. 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 And here's what's funny. Um, the leadership test has some of the most interesting questions that you'd only know the right answer if you studied the answer book, which I did, right? I'd studied the answer right. book, which is one of the reasons I had such great scores. Um, he, let me give you an example of a question that you'd never think this was the answer. When a, when a, when a pre-clear gets a benefit from auditing, what is the true source of the pre-clear's recovery? Is it the auditing commands themselves? Is it the auditor? Or is it L. Ron Hubbard? Well, the, hmm. the right answer on the test is L. Ron Hubbard is the true source of any betterment that has ever happened in any person getting auditing ever. It's not the auditor. It's not the commands. It's L. Ron Hubbard. That's the right answer. 
But that, but who would think that way? I would think the auditor or the commands is the more obvious answer to me. But let's go to this because L. Ron Hubbard is the source of Scientology. Right. And this is a question that Scientologists will always deflect. You ask them, is L. Ron Hubbard God in Scientology? Mm -hmm. The first answer I, any Scientologist would give you is no, of course not. Is that a public relations answer? Oh, no, no, no. Scientologists do not view L. Ron Hubbard as a God. I mean, in their minds, they don't. When you actually kind of look at it objectively, you're like, no, no, you really do. You, you are taking his word as infallible. You do sort of think of him as God, even though you've convinced yourselves that you don't. So how can L. Ron Hubbard be non-God and the source of Scientology that's eternal? Well, honestly, Scientologists do not really view Scientology as a religion per se. I, I, religion is a tax word. I mean, if, if there wasn't right. a tax significance associated with the word religion, no one would ever mention the word religion. It's, it's hmm. become an accepted thing of wink, wink, we call it a religion. And the best way to get someone to leave you alone is pretend like they're attacking your religion. I mean, it's just like calling them a bigot or... You know, it's just like sure. shutting down an argument by calling someone a racist instead of having the argument. Um, as a Scientologist and as someone who grew up as a Sea Org member and a staff member, I can tell you, me and my contemporaries did not view what we were doing as religious work or religious activity. I mean, we thought we were helping people, but it, we thought it was more, you know, more scientific. It was the religious was just because that's what the government called us now. So, you know, whatever. Or that's what that's what we had to do to get tax exemption. I mean, we don't take that seriously. I mean. Uh, uh, staff members swear and they curse and they screw and they cheat and there, there's no there's no like Christian values going on in Scientology. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> no, no, actually, I'm glad I'm glad you're saying this because they a, a couple things to ask you. Scientology promotes itself as being the most ethical group on the planet, mm -hmm. and so you know one would expect high ethical standards in the Sea Org. Mm -hmm. But from my experience talking to Sea Org execs, it's no different than corporate life, except in corporate life, we got paid more and we got to go home at night and we weren't beaten. Right. <laughs> but, but corporate life is brutal. Anyone who's ever held a high corporate position knows corporate life is brutal and unforgiving. Yeah. Now, so they call themselves the most ethical group on the planet. Number two, they say their goal of the Sea Org is to put Scientology ethics on a planet and to achieve planetary clearing. Did you think you were in for the cause of planetary clearing? You know, it's such an abstract idea. The truth is, no, you, you don't wake up in the morning and go, let's get one step closer to planetary clearing today. That's just, that was just rhetoric, really. Um, you know, any staff member or CERG member gets up and all they can focus on is the one person in front of them that they're helping at that time. And that's really what kept me going. And actually, I've said this to many people that, when I was in the Sea Org, I could have been exposed to everything I now know about Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard, and David Miscavige. And the truth is, it would not have mattered to me one bit. Because your attention is so riveted on what you're doing and your, your overall importance to the organization that, you know, if someone were to come up to me and start talking shit about David Miscavige, I would almost be like, first, my first response would be, who cares? How does that affect my day-to-day -day life here on post? But then if someone started talking to me about, you know, L. Ron Hubbard this and the ex-wives that and the kidnapping the daughter this and the lying that, I'd be like, you know what? The analogy that, that I used for a long time, I'm borrowing it from someone else, is that the guy who created the Volkswagen, the Volkswagen is a great car and you could tell me anything you wanted about the guy who created it. It wouldn't change the fact that the Volkswagen is a great car. For a while, I used that analogy. As I came to understand more and more of the true nature of Scientology, I changed the analogy to be, but if the reason you bought the Volkswagen is because you thought it was a rocket ship that was going to take you to Mars, and then you found out it was really just a Volkswagen, you'd probably be pretty pissed off. So <laughs> I sort of amended the analogy to uh, be more in line with my, my new way of thinking. Aaron, t tell me about how money works in an org. So um, specifically, well, uh, let's just take Asho, okay? Sure. So, the money comes into the registrar who works in Division Two, the Dissemination Division, and that, that's where people are paid. Uh, that's where people pay their money for auditing and training. So all that money is pooled together. At the, all the money that's been made at Asho, it was anywhere between eighty and two hundred thousand dollars a week. Two hundred thousand dollars was actually a very good week. Um, and a, a certain cut, and I can't remember to be honest the exact percentages involved here. There's a certain cut that goes to int management a certain cut that goes to the local continental management, um, a certain cut that goes to Golden Era Productions, 
Um, and then there is a certain cut that the local flag banking officer just takes a, a, an extra 12%. We never really knew what that was for. That was kind of discretionary. Like if we were really short and we didn't have enough money for things like toilet paper, we could ask her to give us some of that money back at the end of the week. But we had to give her a really good reason why. <laughs> the other stuff was non-negotiable. Um, so basically the FBO, the flag banking officer, and flag in this sense doesn't refer to flag here in Clearwater. It refers to flag management in Los Angeles. Flag is used many different ways. Okay. So okay. Uh, she's basically the financial representative of international management that's or, – or of um, – yeah, international management who's in the local org. Okay? So at the end of the week, she gives us our allocation. So that's whatever percentage of the money is left over that didn't get sent up lines. She gives it to us, and it's up to us to take those dollars and spread them out amongst the divisions to cover the, the basic weekly necessities. Uh, you could just call them the weekly operating expenses. And, and that's well, one thing that is pretty neurotic about working in an org is everything is weekly. Everything is weekly. You can't do annual planning. You can't do a five-year plan. You can't do a 10-year plan. It's all done weekly. Uh, yeah, every week we would sit down at, on Thursday night and go over our allocation and break it out amongst the uh, financial necessities of the divisions. And the first thing that would be cut is pay. The next thing that would be cut is food. And then we would um, cut into other operating expenses. That's a general description of how it works. And so you have to pay for things like um, utilities. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example. I've actually yeah. got a list in front of me of some of the actual expenses that we would have to cover. So um, birthing utilities. So this is interesting. Um, international management has owned these buildings for a very long time, okay? We did pay rent. Like, we would pay rent to international management for the birthing where the Sea Org members lived, right? Really? Now, this is at the complex in LA. Correct. We were paying $5,000 a week for rent expense to the church, to the, you know, the, the, the senior church body, f forwarding up. Now, this is in addition to the percentages that they already took just for being there. Okay, um, five thousand dollars a week to to pay for Sea members to live. This is about two hundred. This is about two hundred Sea members. Five thousand dollars a week. We're paying the church for the Sea members to live in church birthings, and it's really just a way to siphon more money up to international management. You know, and and the birthing here is is bunk beds, crowded dorms. Yeah, bunk beds. yeah. If you're single, eight to eight to twelve people in a room. Eight to twelve people on bunk beds in a room. Okay, so you have you're paying rent. To live in a complex. Right. So there's child care. And God, I don't – like literally, I'm looking at the actual list that, that we would use of, of the financial necessities. What was this chi – oh, child care. That's right. So um, in, in recent years, I've heard many people say there's no such thing as a cadet org anymore. That is just not true. <laughs> that is just not true. It's not as big as it used to be, but there are children who – are cadets. It's just a fact. Um, and so in, in, in PAC, there was a cadet org. It was very small. There was maybe 15 kids in, in the cadet org, but they were there. And uh, the person who was put in charge of them, sometimes they would actually bring in non Sea Org help. And so this is just a childcare expense for any of the cadets that were, um, I guess, ASHO sort of had responsibility for them because they were children of, of ASHO's Sea Org members. Now, Aaron, did you have a soft spot in your heart for these children having grown up in a nursery um you know a soft spot in my heart i don't want to over sentimentalize uh, sent, uh make it too sentimental i mean i like sure. them. i love children i've always loved children that's why the moment i got you know out of the sewer we, we banged out three kids pretty quick <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so actually you know i'm glad you asked me that there was a period when i was actually between orgs um i'd gotten in trouble at asho i was supposed to go over to aola but i wasn't there yet and and the, the, these these cadets they they didn't have anyone to take them on their their little field trips, and because I was sort of in in limbo land and I didn't have to answer to anyone you know during, I could sort of disappear and nobody would know, I would actually take the cadets in my car, huh. and we would go to the public pool, <laughs> we would go to the public pool so that they could have their little outings so they weren't holed up doing you know studying courses or doing uh, physical labor all day, and um, but honestly I did that. Uh, I did it because I wanted to, but also because nobody else would. The person who was actually in charge of them was too busy to do it. And, and they asked me. Wow. They asked me if I would do it. And I was like, hell, I'd rather be at the pool than on course, so let's go. Sure. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so that was childcare. Dental office. They actually managed to convince a dentist who was an OTA to join the Sea Org and be the dentist for all the Sea Org members. And you'd think that she would have like great bedside manner and have, you know, yeah. and, and uh, she was a bitch. I don't mind saying it. She was a bitch. I would show up sometimes. To, I would get my teeth cleaned frequently. But sometimes I would show up and she'd be like, oh, no, I'm sorry. Your org didn't pay this week. And it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't like, <laughs> I'm really sorry. It wasn't like, I feel really terrible, but I'm not allowed to. Or I'm going to get in trouble. It was almost like, you did not pay me. Go away. It was, it was, it was actually offensive. Um, okay. So there was dental expenses. Um, food, $3,400. Let's crunch some math here. Yeah. $3,400 for 200 people for a week. So 3,400 divided by 200, that's $17 for the week. $17 divided by seven, that is $2.42 per day, divided by three meals, that is 81 cents per meal. Aaron, I'm glad you crunched the numbers. I've talked to Camilla Anderson, other people. Mm -hmm. 81 cents is less than they spend on prisoners in the California state prison system. And they probably get better food. I'm sure they get better food because why? The law protects them. They don't have religious protection. Right. You're not, the prisoners can complain about the food they eat, but it's not slop. How and, and, and the church has tried to respond in uh, recent years on its website by saying, well, we buy organic beef, we buy in quantity. But Mark Headley has told some really funny stories. And I, I mean, funny, like now that he's out of it, but about how you'd buy from Cisco. Or Costco? And this, no, oh, Cisco. Cisco, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, you'd buy, uh, the Imp Base would buy from Cisco and the food trucks would, pull up but if there wasn't a check ready the trucks would leave oh god and if the if the food delivery wasn't made he i have a really funny video mark headley did about rancid tacos <laughs> I, I listened to and, that i i heard that one <laughs> but see this is what this is what uh the real slice of life uh, what is really like is what people want to hear what do you get to eat for 81 cents per meal what was your experience of the food yeah well uh luckily i i liked eggs so i had that going for me um I also had a pretty big appetite, so I would probably have, uh, you know, 15 eggs in the morning or whatever. Uh, it was all about eggs and chicken, Jeffrey. Eggs and chicken is, um, you got to come to like eggs and chicken. <laughs> um, you know, hamburgers, maybe hamburger Wednesdays. Um, I'm trying to think. They got creative. Um, it was, uh, you know, they weren't very big on the carbs. That, that, that's one thing they did have is, um, going for them is, they kept it high protein. It might not have been high quality protein, but it was a lot of protein. A lot of protein. For, and for a growing boy like me, that was important. So. Well, no, that's good. Now, uh, you were telling me that there you had desserts one night a week. Yeah, it was dessert night. Thursday night was uh, was uh, ice cream Sunday night. Sometimes they would really uh, sexy it up and make it like some blueberry cobbler. But I'll tell you, you have never seen grown men fight like like they would when – Okay, they would bring up the dessert. It's already a known fact there's not enough dessert to go around for the whole base. And it's also a known fact that the base eats in shifts, and the last shift is the most likely to get screwed. So everyone's trying to sneak into the earlier meal shifts, and you know they, they make sure to bring the dessert out kind of towards the end of the shift. And, oh, my God, to see a wave of, of 200 bodies rush to the – grown-ass adults for the most part – rushing to the front of the room to fight – over who was going to get the Sundays and the cobbler. It, it's embarrassing to look back on it, actually. But um, but, 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 but we look forward to those Thursdays. Don't get me wrong. No, but the misery. You work uh, – just say, you know, low level. You work all day in your bellhop uniform as a body router. You work the mean streets of Hollywood, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, not me, but <laughs> – Well, I'm just I'm, – I'm taking a, a, a low level Sea Org member because I, I see them out at Vermont and Sunset. Yeah. They're in their bellhop uniforms. Right. They're like theater ushers, bellhops, you know, and they have this hungry look. They've approached me in the crosswalk. And and I'm thinking, well, now, you might go back to a dinner of rice and beans. You might not get paid any money. Right. And I don't I don't give them a hard time. I have compassion for these Sioux members. Yeah. I mean, these, I, you know, I was a religious worker when I was young. I mean, I had to go door to door with my church. And I didn't like it. I didn't like to have to tell people about Jesus. Right. And I had this big spiritual obligation. You always have to witness. Are you witnessing for Christ? Are you leading souls to Christ? And it's like, I don't want to. <laughs> well, there was a problem with that, buddy. You know, it, and, and 
And I would be told, you better get your heart right with Jesus. Right. You better get your heart right with God, because if you're not bringing <clears throat> souls to the kingdom. But now the difference is I could go home at night after we witnessed at, you know, a park or the beach or wherever. Right. So your Sea Org members on Thursday, they're fighting over dessert. Yeah. Now, that's kind of a bleak existence, wouldn't you say? It is, but it's one of these things when you're in it, it yeah. doesn't feel like it. And this is one thing I really wanted to actually get on the record because I've, yeah. I've heard some people say this, and for me, it's profound. When I was in the Sea Org, I never had nightmares about being in the Sea Org. I wouldn't have nightmares about posts. I wouldn't have nightmares about my seniors giving me a hard time. When I left the Sea Org, I started having very bad nightmares about being back in the Sea Org. Now, what does that say? That it wasn't a source of mental distress for me while I was there. At least it didn't seem like it was. But once I was gone, it was now the subject of my nightmares. How weird is that? Well, it's not, it's not weird if you were repressing... Uh, if you were repressing your feelings, mm -hmm. if you're good at thought stopping and control. Now, not everyone is as, as adaptable as you are, Aaron. There is post-traumatic stress syndrome. Yeah. That is, you can survive in an intense atmosphere. Mm -hmm. When I say nightmares, I mean waking up in a state of near terror for about two seconds until I oriented myself to where I actually was. Because, because in my dream, it wasn't just like I'd never left the Sea Org. In my dream, it was I had been re-recruited for the Sea Org. And I'm thinking to myself, God damn, I got out of this once. I'm not going to be able to get out of this again. And I would wake up. And after it would take me three or four seconds to sort of realize I was in my own home and in my own bed and go, God damn, th I knew I couldn't have been that stupid. I knew I couldn't have been that stupid to join again. And it was really profound, you know. But it shows that there was a reservoir of, of problems you're dealing with. Yeah. And, and Aaron, I got to tell you, I am so glad you're going to do podcasts and videos. And I'll tell you why. Sometimes only someone who has been in the Sea Org can understand someone who's been in the Sea Org. Right. Sometimes only a Scientologist can understand another Scientologist. Mm -hmm. And I think the more people we have talking about it, you know, and, and before the show, I was urging you to do some videos on how to help Sea Org members who've left the Sea Org who feel like they're failures. I worked for a cult. I'm having bad dreams. How do I even start in life when I'm at such a tremendous deficit? Right. And they've been taught to be afraid of the WOG world, how vicious it is. Mm -hmm. So the Sea Org experience, it's not uncommon for people to have nightmares because it was an, in, an intense experience. Right. And when you have to survive something, you're only concerned with surviving it that day. Mm -hmm. That's very true. And some people are more resilient. They actually got through the Sea Org because they were tough or they were adaptable. Yeah. But when you leave, it catches up with you. Yep. So how do people process the Scientology? Uh, the, I'm sorry. How do people process the post-Sea Org experience? How did you do it? What did you do about your dreams? What, what did you do about your nightmares? You know, I, the truth is I didn't do anything about them. Um, they just eventually went away. And it took years, it took years for them to go away. Um, so I've been out of the Sea Org now for uh, about nine years. And it probably took at least four years before those, those dreams almost completely went away, those nightmares. Now, I was also, I have to say, I think um, much more fortunate than many others who've walked a similar path to me. I already had a lot of experience in the real world before I joined the Sea Org. Like the whole time I was on staff in Philadelphia, I had a normal, um, I don't use the term WOG, but a Scientologist would call it a WOG job. I had a normal job in the real world. In fact, I, you know, I went into a temp agency and I went in, you know, nice, good looking young gentleman with a good conversation skills, walked in. I, I said, I basically sat down, I did all their, their tests. They basically acted like uh, you know, God's greatest gift had just walked through their door. They were so <laughs> jumping over themselves to get me the job first because they're like, oh, my God, a well-spoken young person who looks professional and knows how to use a computer. Let me get you a job immediately. So I was, <laughs> I was able to get good, real jobs in the real world. I worked as uh, HR, um, HR coordinator for the Philadelphia Orchestra. I worked um, at uh, enrollment for AmeriHealth. I mean, real jobs. So, yeah. And actually, when I joined the Sea Org, I, I owned a house that I never sold when I joined the Sea Org. Really? So, uh -huh. um, 
I I already had a pretty good grounding on what the real world was. I didn't buy all this bullshit of the world's a dangerous place and oh you're the, the Sea Org members would literally be told in these base wide meetings, um, you have it easy. You guys have it easy. You don't have to deal with all that bullshit out there. Those people out hmm. there, it's rough. It, it's it's dangerous. And I'm sitting here going, oh come on guys, can we can we like can we go to bed please? Like this is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> That is funny. And so even though I'm telling you I had these nightmares, it was much easier, I think, for me to decompress. I think my experience has been more similar to Chris Shelton's than some of these other horror stories that you hear of how hard it was for them to recover or get on their feet or whatever. Um, you know, people are always shocked that Chris has been able to um, turn his thinking around so quickly. It's, he's only been a couple of years out. Um, it wasn't that dissimilar for me, you know? Um and and that's actually one of the reasons Chris videos have had such an impact on me is I, I look at the way he talks about his experience. I look at the way he communicates and, and it really resonated with me that there's so many similarities to how he's able to analytically um, and calmly and rationally look back at his experience and discuss it. That made me want to also do it as well. Yes. And I would say my friend, Chris Shelton, he's a good friend of, of Karen and I. He's doing outstanding work. Yeah. What I, w what I would say as a long-term Scientology watcher, when Chris left, there was more help available than there's ever been. There were more resources online, more former members. Yeah. In fact, as, as uh, Karen and I like to joke, there's more RTC out here than there are in the church. <laughs> no, there are. We have, there's more former executives out here than they have left in the church. Yeah. So one of the benefits of podcasts a video of publications is there's more help available to, to decompress. So some of the comments on Tony Ortega's blog are to the effect that the um, decompression timeframes are faster than ever. Yeah. Because there's more support organizations. And I remember when I lost my faith at age 21, there was no support organization. You're a Christian. You've just wasted five of the best years of your life. And you have a, you know, my, major was biblical studies and I barely converted it to an English degree. Right. You know, what do I do? I've lost my faith. I feel lost and I have a uh, biblical studies background that I don't want. Right. So I'm glad you said it because I think, I think Chris is pioneering a, uh, a new way to get yourself out of the church, healing through writing, healing through communication. Aaron, what I want to do is I want to go back. So we took a little bit of a detour. I want to go back to the money. Sure, sure, sure. There's an expense item called flag room and board. That's right. So that would be for um, Sea Org members who were a staff of ASHO who were sent to flag um, to train, to do, to do auditor training or other types of training. So that $800 isn't even necessarily what was owed that week for flag. What happens is every org in Scientology has a giant bill that they owe to flag for room and board for anyone they have ever sent to train at flag ever from day one so it was really just 800 on this list i have in front of me 800 dollars that we had earmarked to send to flag that week that's actually flag here in clearwater not flag management it was so you're paying off a mountain of debt for trainees to flag exactly now there's an item dry cleaning yeah all those all those clothes have to be dry cleaned and um and there is that the uh, int management actually has their own dry cleaning facilities on the base. That was, that's not true for Los Angeles. We actually have to outsource that stuff. So you can see we were spending $1,200 on dry cleaning. Um, you know, about a third of what we spent on food. So every week you have, uh, about 1200 in dry cleaning. Yep. Yep. Wow. Now payroll, I'm looking at 8250. Yeah. About 200 staff members that comes to $41 and 25 cents per person per week, which is, uh, you know, pretty good labor if you can get it. Well, no kidding. Aaron, I really appreciate having you on the show today. A question I'd like to ask guests, and I'll ask you, what would you say to people who are still in the Church of Scientology, particularly Sea Org members? Well, <clears throat> I feel like the best answer that I have is more of what I would say to Scientologists in general. So let me, let me give you that, and if I have any other special um, message to Sea Org members, I'll try to articulate that. Please. To people who are still in Scientology in general, I would... Try to get them to, to – well, the message is really that um, the church likes to characterize anybody who's encouraging critical thought on the subject of Scientology. The church likes to characterize them all as just evil, 
suppressive church attackers. And the message that I would like to communicate is pretty much that, look, it doesn't have to be black and white, and you don't have to hate Scientology or turn on Scientology to start asking critical questions. So for me personally, just because I have come to learn that there are no more OT levels, and therefore the whole promise of Scientology is a lie, right? There is no such thing as full OT. L. Ron Hubbard never achieved it. No one in Scientology is going to achieve it. So therefore, Scientology is a lie. That is not. Um, that does not mean that someone couldn't have had wins in Scientology, uh, couldn't have felt better when they uh, theoretically achieved the state of clear. It doesn't mean Scientology couldn't have saved their child from a, a drug habit or any of these things. See, these things aren't mutually exclusive. You can have benefited from Scientology, and Scientology can also be, in its overall scope, a complete lie. And someone has to be able to understand that someone who's encouraging critical thought on the subject of Scientology is not someone who hates you, who hates Scientology, who hates L. Ron Hubbard. They're just trying to discuss truth. And it's one of the ways that the church is able to sort of mentally imprison people um, is by running this thing on them that anyone who's trying to say anything negative to you is your enemy. And it's, it's very much in that way like North Korea, you know, building up this whole um, weird idea of what people outside of your little bubble think about you. And, um, and, and so that, that really is the message that – oh, and actually here's a more specific message. My overall take here isn't that everyone should just drop and run away from Scientology right now. It's not like Scientology is literally harming everyone who's in it. There's people in it who probably get nothing but benefit. You know, uh, at least they've never been, sure. they've never been exposed to the bad. They haven't had to drop uh, a quarter mil on auditing yet. You know what I mean? My my thing is this: when push comes to shove, and the ethics officer is twisting your arm behind your back, telling you why you have to disconnect from your family or lose your eternity, or, or else you're going to lose your eternity, that's when it's helpful to have a little bit of context of why there is no such thing as full OT. There is no OT 9 and 10. There is no 11, OT 11 through 15. There is no OT 22. It's not that everyone should just drop the subject as a whole. It's that you have to have a context to make an informed decision. And the proper context is there is no such thing as full OT. You're being lied to. LRH lied to you. David Miscavige is lying to you. And why do you want to be a part of something where you're being lied to? Like a lot of Scientologists go, you know what? Scientology um, uh, cured my son of his drug problem. Therefore, everything about Scientology is always right and always will be right. And anything you say is a personal attack on my faith. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. Your son can have been cured of his drug problem. And Scientology can also be a lie. <laughs> These two things can be true. And unfortunately, it is true. Scientology is a lie. And keep that in mind when someone's uh, telling you why you should disconnect from your mother, or your father, or your son, or your daughter. And that, that's my message. <laughs> Those are uh, powerful words, Aaron. We thank you so much for being on the show today. Our guest today, Aaron Smith-Levin. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. And as always, we'll be in very good touch.